Good morning, everybody. Welcome this morning. It's lovely to see you all here. And welcome to our visitors this morning. It's great you could make it. And welcome to our online audience. Uh, we just pray that we will all um, have some wonderful time of fellowship with each other as we worship and praise our God on high. Um, if you would please like to stand as we bring the Bible into our, into our midst. Um, this encourages us to know that um, all that we do in our service is based on the word of God. Thank you, Kevin. Please be seated. Uh, so today is Palm Sunday, and I hope you've all got access to one of these. Let me know if you don't have access to one of these. Hold them up. You will be participating with me this morning. We have, um, these have got two, two um, things that we're going to do with them. Firstly, we're going to have a very short drama, and at the end of that drama, you will be waving these in the air, and you will be shouting Hosanna and the other words that are on the screen to help with the drama. The second thing I will ask you to do is there should be some pens scattered around. Um, today, traditionally, um, in Australia, is the day that the church um, communities gather in cities and towns and march for peace. Now, I didn't know that um, when I was um, working on the service. I saw that and I thought, oh, if I did know that, I've forgotten it, but I remember it now. So um, the service is going to be about peace. So in the prayers for others, we're going to be writing something on our palm leaves and we'll be bringing those that are able, bringing forward and placing with the palms on the table here. Um, there will be our prayers of peace for others. Okay, so if you don't have a palm leaf, there are some around, so please make sure you get a palm leaf. Okay, our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 118, verses 1 and 2, and then verses 19 to 29. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. And then from verse 19. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvellous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let us pray. Merciful God, as we enter Holy Week and gather at your house of prayer, turn our hearts again to Jerusalem, to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that united with Christ, and all the faithful, me, we may one day enter in triumph the city not made by human hands, the new Jerusalem, eternal in the heavens, where with you and the Holy Spirit, Christ lives in glory forever. Amen. We will now sing our first um, song, which is Majesty. I think we're we'll sing through twice. So please stand and join singing in Majesty.
Please be seated. Let us pray our prayer of confession. Like the people who greeted Jesus as he entered Jerusalem and later pronounced, crucify him, we are fickle people who often deny Christ in our thoughts, words and deeds. Remembering the events of Jesus' last week helps us to see ourselves for what we are, sinners in need of a saviour, a saviour Praise God, we have in Christ. In honesty and hope, we confess now our sins to God. O King of glory, we confess that our praise of your majesty has often been faint, our performance as citizens of your kingdom treasonous. For we have surrendered to the enemy by our secret and known sins. For our treason you died, Lord Jesus. For our restoration you rose again. Draw us closer to you in this holy week, that our eyes may catch the vision of your tears and our hearts the wonder of your grace. By the Holy Spirit's continuing discipline, let us be loyal and loving servants of the King. Praise be to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I now invite you to join with me in saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, we're children, it's your turn, but you don't have to come to the front this time. You can stay where you are, because we're going to do a little drama for you. And we're going to just get our guys together. Okay. So, meet Jesus. With an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> and... These are two of Jesus' disciples, and over there we have a bystander. Okay. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, Jesus called two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, You'll find there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it to me. <coughs> People will ask you why you're doing this. Just say, this is for the Lord, and he will return, send it back immediately. So, scratching their heads and then nodding in agreement, they went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. And as they were untying it, we'll let them find the colt first. As they were untying it, <laughs> some of the bystanders said to them, Hey, why don't you do untying that colt? The Lord needs it. Jesus said we were allowed to take it. <laughs> so they told them what Jesus had said. And they allowed them to take it. And then they brought the colt to Jesus. <laughs> and they threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. <laughs> you can see we rehearsed this. So he sat on it, 
And many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. And then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, now this is your turn, so pick up your palm leaves. And here we are, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he, coming in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. <laughs> then Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So I hope you enjoyed the little drama that was so well rehearsed. <laughs> So, um, onward. <laughs> We're now going to join in singing. And children, do you want to come up and get some musical instruments for this one? now receive our free will offering. Now I'd like to give you the opportunity to share what God may have been doing over the last however long. Has anyone got anything they'd like to share? So yesterday, we, um, a few of us attended the regional gathering here, and uh, there were two components to it. One was on an intergenerational church, and one was on music and worship. And I think that last song fulfilled both criteria. We had the children involved as the musicians, and uh, yeah, the, the, the point of the music and worship was, have a go, you can do it. <laughs> For many, many, many years, my routine has been to get up in the morning and go to the study and sit there and do my quiet time. Then summer came and it was very hot. So I changed and I first took Lulu for a walk and then I would go back and sit in the study. But because I'm working from home now, when I go to the study to go and sit there, phone may ping, or other things happen. And when I see I'm so in, folded in my work that I never opened my Bible and I never spent time with God. And I had supervision on Wednesday morning and the supervisor sent me a form to fill in and one of the questions was, what is playing on your mind? And I started to write nothing. And then she had a sentence starting with, as I'm sitting here pondering, what comes to mind is, 
And I realized I felt very guilty because I don't get to spend time with God like I used to. And so we talked about other things and then we got to that. And she got me to close my eyes and just envision Jesus in my day, the day before. And where was Jesus in that day? And as I was sitting, and, and I'm not very good at visualizing, but as I was sitting there, I could just see Jesus um, taking Lulu for a walk with me, sitting in the car with me as I was driving. I drive 700 k's on Tuesday. S sitting in the car as, he was, as, I, as I was driving. And then she asked me, what did his face look like? And I realized he wasn't angry with me. He wasn't judging me. He wasn't upset with me. He just loved me. And that was just the most beautiful realization for me to realize that God is not a God of, come on, you need to do this and this and this and this with a big stick. He just wants us to be with him. And it just freed me up so much that now I'm back to my old retreat where I first spend time with him, and then I take the dog for a walk, and then I do the rest of my day. But it was just such, so good to realize that he loves me regardless. Amen to that. Does anyone else want to share? Yesterday at the, um, at the gathering, um, we were talking about intergenerational churches, and one of the comments was, you know, you don't have to worry about filling the church because God will put people in your church. And then we get three new visitors today. Yeah. That, that just blew me away. Sometimes the speed at which God does stuff blows my mind. Okay, we're now um, a prayer of thanks, so if you'd like to pray with me. Almighty God, we thank you for choosing us as your sons and daughters. We thank you that you have promised that you will never leave us. We thank you for being ever present in our lives, that you continue to perform miracles, that you are near us in our everyday joys and struggles. We offer up today our sacrifice of finances, and along with that, we offer up ourselves, because no one is too young or too old to be called to do your work here on earth. May our gifts today be used to further your kingdom here on earth. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I will now invite Kathy up um, for our Bible reading, and then Bob will be bringing the message. Now the reading is from Mark 11, 1 to 11. As they approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and will send it back, up, back here shortly. They went and found the colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing, untying the colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. Then they brought the colt to Jesus, and threw their cloaks over it. He sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the ground, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and, and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, 
he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And this is the word of the Lord. A month ago, I preached on Transfiguration Sunday with the title, The God Who Is Not Silent. I took that title from Psalm 50, verse 3. Our God comes and does not keep silence. I'm taking today's title from the same verse, The God Who Arrives. In my Transfiguration sermon, I talked about the paradox that even though Christ came into the world to make it easy for all people to approach God, no matter how high or low they may be in the eyes of the world, no matter what racial or religious background they may come from, or no matter how virtuous or sinful they might be, modern people are less aware of the divine in the world than ever before and frankly, don't see the point of Jesus. So, what is the point of Jesus? To many people nowadays, perhaps most, there is no point. The modern view of the world has no need for the divine. Modern science has helped us understand how the world works far too well. We know what drives the world's weather systems. We can predict the motions of heavenly bodies solely on the basis of physical principles. We understand and can manipulate the productivity of agricultural crops and animals and natural ecosystems. And we are aware of the biological basis of physical and mental disease. There's no need for divine agency to explain these things. And that means there's no need for the old gods of Greece and Rome and ancient Israel's neighbours. Their gods were invented to explain the things I've just been talking about. They were gods of fertility, weather gods, gods of the heavens and gods of war, the Baals, the Astartes and the Marducks of the Old Testament. The God of Israel is different. He does not simply make the world run and is not indifferent to humanity. According to Andrew Root, who is a professor of um, youth ministry at Luther Seminary in the United States, Israel's God, and by extension the Christian God, is recognised because he intervenes in history in specific events. That is, he arrives. Perhaps what is even more significant is that he arrives in ways that can be perceived by individuals as he intervenes in their lives in a very personal way. Let me explain what I mean. Over the past six weeks, David de Kock has taken us on a whirlwind tour of the sacred history of Israel on the road to Easter. We've met many individuals to whom God has arrived in a very personal way, sometimes with unfortunate outcomes, as in the case of Adam and Eve, and others with more constructive outcomes, like Abraham, Jacob and Moses, but always with profound outcomes. By the time of Moses, Israel had grown to a large and populous nation who were also witness to the arrival of God. They, all of the people, how many hundred thousand of them there were, I can't remember, but they all witnessed the arrival of God in history. But they don't appear to have been as profoundly affected as their leader as we see the way they continually strayed. And the rest of the story of the road to Easter 
is the unfolding of God's plan to rectify that straying. Andrew Root especially focuses on God's arrival to Abraham, to Hagar and to Moses. Uh, You might have guessed that these are not my original ideas, but they're based on a book that I've been reading. Of Abram, Root says, Abram is secure and safe in the house of his father, living happily in the causative continuity of his father's gods. When a god whom Abraham Abram does not know, arrives. Abram experiences a radically different kind of God, the only true living God, because this God comes as an arrival. So, there was a point, there was a part of Abram's life when he didn't know God. God was completely absent, And then an event event happened. The event was the arrival of the only true living God. Abram met him. And this God speaks to Abram. Abram listens. And Abram acts. Abram leaves his father's home and goes to where? Somewhere he he knows not where. And... Throughout Abram's life, God keeps on arriving and speaking again and again. And as we know, a mighty nation was born. Now, Root paints Abram as somewhat inept. God had promised him to make a, that his descendants would be a great nation. And through those descendants, he would bless the entire world. But Abram was getting somewhat on in years, and still he had no descendants. He had no children. Ah, you can imagine his wife, Sarai, saying to him, Abram, what's this promise about? It's not happening. And she took, she took matters in her own hands. Um, wives tend to do that sometimes, don't they? And she came up with her own plan, which involved uh, manipulating Abram into sleeping with her slave girl in order to get a son that way. Well, Genesis 16 describes how the plan backfired on Sarai when Hagar conceived and began to look down on her mistress. Hagar looked down on her barren mistress and, I don't know, you can imagine her laughing. I have Abram's child and you don't. But then that response backfired on Hagar and... uh, Her mistress mistreated her so badly that Hagar fled into the wilderness, apparently uh, preferring to go into the unknown, possibly die, than to put uh, put up with the treatment that she was being dealt by Sarai. Imagine the despair that Hagar felt. She'd been sexually exploited by her master and mistress, ostensibly with their blessing, but that blessing was withdrawn when they saw the consequences and they turned against her. Hagar was Egyptian. She was in a foreign country with no obvious means of support. All her family was back in Egypt. Even if they cared about her, I suppose they'd sold her into slavery. Um, 
She was probably only a teenager and she was pregnant. She is about as low as a young girl can get when God arrives. She, she was uh, by a spring of water in the wilderness. God arrived and said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarai, where have you come from? And where are you going? Hagar said, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. And God said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. Root's book that I mentioned before, out of which some of these ideas come, is about the role of the pastor in a secular age. He describes how God acts as a pastor by meeting Hagar in the wilderness and ministering to her. God searches for her. Hagar's running away. God goes out and searches for her. He calls her by name. Uh, he, sa he says that Ab Abram and Sarai hadn't called Hagar by name. Abram had just referred to her as your slave girl. But God calls her by name. He encourages Hagar to confess why she was in the predicament she's in. Then he gives her a task to perform. He tells her to go back to her mistress and submit to her. God ministers to Hagar in her predicament and he sends her back to Sarai to minister to Sarai. Although Sarai is made out to be the villain in the story, she needs ministry as well. She feels the shame of being childless and having a mere slave girl treat her with disdain because of it. The point for us today, and I think uh, this is very pertinent in the, um, in the light of what Debbie told us about Carol Burnett, the point for us today is that when God arrives, it is often to minister to us, and when we benefit from God's ministry, he wants us to minister to others. Moses also fled into the wilderness in shame when God arrives. Moses thought he could help his people in his own strength and he killed one of the Egyptian oppressors. But Instead of the Israelites uh, rallying to the cause, they rejected him, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? And the particular Israelite who said that said, Do you mean to kill me as you killed that Egyptian? So Moses felt a failure. He disappeared into the wilderness and I'm not sure how long he was out there. He made a he certainly made a life for himself out there as a shepherd and started a family. But God arrived. He found Moses in the wilderness. He called him by name and he spoke to him. He said out of the burning bush, he called, Moses, Moses. God uh, ministered to Moses in his uh, shame, I suppose, of having failed his people. And he gave him a task and a promise. He tasked him to go back to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. 
And he promised, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. God ministered to Moses, helping him to overcome his shame and sent him to minister to the people of Israel in their suffering, leading them out of physical slavery in Egypt as well as their spiritual slavery to sin. Well, you might ask me, what's all this got to do with Palm Sunday? Well, I th- to me it's obvious that on Palm Sunday, Jesus arrives. It is a specific place, a sp- a specific place, a specific time in history that we can pinpoint. It's recorded that Jesus arrives. In each of the three ca- the three cases I've talked about uh, with Abram, Hagar and Moses, God arrives unexpectedly. Neither Abram, nor Hagar, nor Moses expected to meet God where and when they did until he arrived. They were not seeking God, but still God arrived. God sought them out. In the same way, Jerusalem was not seeking God when Jesus arrived on the back of a colt. The people of Jerusalem already thought they knew God. They already thought God was on their side. They may have been under Roman oppression, but spiritually they were self-satisfied. They thought they were better than anyone else. They may not have been seeking God, but Jesus sought them. The people, the common people of Jerusalem, recognised Jesus as someone important as he entered, but in a few days they utterly rejected him putting him to death on a cross. But he had arrived and the wheels of God's great plan of redemption were in motion. Even Jesus' disciples did not understand the full importance of his arrival at this stage. But that importance would strike them with full power when he next arrived on Easter Sunday and again at Pentecost. In the cases of Abram, Hagar and Moses, God arrived for individuals in a very individual and personal way. We're given, we're given the impression that these are unusual cases, that God picks and chooses whom he arrives for. I don't believe that's the case. God can and will arrive for anyone and everyone. He arrived for all of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and for all of humanity on Easter Day. What is special in the cases of Abram, Hagar and Moses is that they recognised God's arrival. And they responded. We've no idea how many times God has arrived and has not been recognised and to how many people. Or how many times he has arrived and been rec- and people have recognised him but not responded. Indeed, how many times did God arrive for Abram, Hagar and Moses only to be ignored before, eventually, they recognised him. God is calling you. And Jesus wants to arrive in your life 
He has chosen you, as Paul writes to the Ephesians, for adoption as his own children. And he can deliver the ministry you need. Listen, as Abram, Hagar and Moses did, and do not fail to respond as the people of Jerusalem did in the week following Palm Sunday. You will not be disappointed. Thank you for your message, Bob. Uh, we're now going to stand and sing another song. Ride on, ride on in majesty. seated. Now we come to uh, the time of prayer for others so if you'd like to grab your palm leaf and grab a pen and write your prayer for others on the palm leaf I'll give you a moment to do that and then those who are able if you'd like to come forward and place them with the other palm leaves as your prayers for others. Let us close our eyes in prayer. Wonderful and loving God, today we pray to, to you for peace. We pray first of all for those within our community who are in conflict with each other, maybe within our schools, our workplaces, our friendship circles, or our homes. We pray for softened hearts open minds and a desire for peace and resolution. We pray for our state and for our country. We pray for those factions of our society that seem to want to cause friction and to do so in an aggressive manner so as to cause division and hatred. Help them to be able to discuss issues of division with love and compassion and a willingness to come together for the good of the community in order to find peace for all. We are so blessed to live in a country of relative peace and we pray, Father, that this continues. We pray for our world, Father. There is so much turmoil in all sorts of places. 
We especially think of Ukraine and Russia and Israel and Palestine. We pray for a peaceful resolution. We pray for open hearts filled with your love to resolve the wars. We pray for your hand to be upon them and for your, pay, for your peace to rain down upon them. We pray for the innocent people caught up in the middle, for them to have food and shelter, medical help and justice. We bring to you today our own prayers for others and for peace as we join together this Palm Sunday and remember Jesus riding peacefully into Jerusalem and how he responded to the violence that was done to him on Good Friday. We pray all these prayers in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. We're now going to sing our final song, which is Crown Him. Please stand.
please remain standing for the blessing. May God, whose arms were spread on the cross to embrace the whole world, help us this week to take up the cross and follow him. Amen. And please remain standing whilst Kevin uh, takes the Bible out into the world that we may follow him. Thank you, Kevin. Please be seated. Are there any notices that anyone has? If anyone would like prayer, please come and tap one of the elders on the shoulder and we will pray with you. With that, we shall finish the service and please stay for a cup of tea and some fellowship. So thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>